Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your hosts, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Hey everybody, this is Lance from Inside the Firm. Normally you'd be hearing Alex in my voice at the beginning of the podcast, but this week we are doing something a little bit different. Uh, we are sharing some interviews that I did at the AIA conference in Las Vegas with you all. They're insightful, they're wonderful, and I hope you'll enjoy it. This week's episode is with Charette Venture Group, and if you are looking to take your firm to the next level, I would highly recommend you take notes and get in touch with them if possible after this episode. They are great people and they're doing something truly unique for the architecture and architect community. They are helping build some of the best entrepreneurial firms on the planet. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks. All right, I'm here with Todd L. Redding, president and CEO of Charette Venture Group. Todd runs CBG's strategic operations while working directly with their partner firms. He has served in many roles in both the private sector and nonprofit organizations. While serving as the vice president for alumni and development at Grinnell College, he earned an MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He was named the president of and CEO of ASI Signage Innovations in 2008. And in 2011, he was among the first employees of the software startup FunnelWise. Todd is also an adjunct lecturer on entrepreneurialism at the University of Iowa and chair of the board of trustees of Grinnell Regional Medical Center. Todd, welcome to Inside the Firm. Why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about more, more about CBG, how it got started, how you got involved, and what it's all about. Lance, you have just put every one of your listeners to sleep <laughs> with uh, an overly complex introduction. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah. Good morning. It's good to be with you, and uh, great to be here at the convention. Um, so a little about Charette Venture Group. Uh, we started in 2014. Uh, we're the only firm that we've found that uh, is structured like an investment firm to uh, make small architecture firms better businesses. That's really our mission. And we do that in a variety of ways. We have a, a lot of different programs and, and things that we do. One of them is our annual business plan competition. Uh, so we, uh, we host this competition every year. Um, and tonight we'll have a reception here at the convention where we will uh, announce and honor our winner. Um, and it's uh, and that program is uh, all in an effort to try to elevate this topic of how to run a better business when you're running a small architecture firm. We all know that that's uh, an immensely difficult task, running any small business, but certainly in the field of architecture, uh, you have some unique challenges for sure. And and we're we're here to help small firm owners uh, get through those challenges and grow a successful business. Yeah, beautiful. Why? T tell me. Let's back up a little bit about. Uh, so, why? Ex how exactly yeah. did CBG start? Why in the world would you do something like? Well, this? well, yes. yeah. I mean, the competition is amazing. I want to get back to that too. But like, yeah. uh, it, it, you know, what made you concentrate on architecture firms specifically, or or is it broader than that? It just to, to me, it looked like it was mostly architecture. It's firms. just architecture. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have some uh, landscape architects, some engineers that are interested in. So in design, what we do. design field. Yeah, the design sort of field. Pr primarily small architecture firms. And we get asked the why in the world would you do something like this question all the time. <laughs> and it really comes down to the founder uh, of our business, the founder of our company, Matt Ostinick. Uh He is an architect. He's a licensed architect in Iowa. And uh, he, really, he really started this company after seeing such a, a need for business-related resources in the world of small architecture firms. You know, in the tech sector... Uh, there's a business plan competition every day, right? right? Um, and mentor programs and startup contests and all kinds of things. But then you get into the world of design, and it's just it's just non-existent. Business is out the window. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I'm sure he's told you many times, yeah. and we preach this on our podcast all day long that yeah. that's not what's taught in school. Right, right. It's art over everything, and that's great because we we're, we're obviously you know we're in Las Vegas right now at yeah. the AIA convention, and you see all the architecture. So clearly, architects are good at designing things, yeah. but the business component is is so it's just out the window. It's yeah. not really there. So yeah, they just need help. I mean, they need support, they need and they want to make and, right, and they want to make a profit. They want to be successful right yeah 
Well, if they don't, they're not a good partner with the <laughs> CBG. <laughs> yeah. But we, uh, yeah, I mean, that's really our focus is to, is to fill in those gaps that exist uh, for small firms. You know, they can't afford to go hire a full-time VP for marketing or a full-time VP for finance. And, and, uh, and so we, we fill in those gaps for small firms. What's the smallest firm you'll take on? I mean, will you go down to like the one, two person we, shop? We have a we have an incubator program that we uh, provide to to sole proprietors, but but it's pretty selective. You know, you have to be a sole proprietor that wants to grow. Uh, you really want to build your firm and multiply. Yeah, yeah, multiply and a lot of them don't, and they don't. Yeah, right. Yeah. And if you if you want to stay a sole proprietor, God bless you. You'll I'm, the many have a great well. I great think career. there's a statistic out there. Something like half of architects are just sole proprietors, you know, and yeah. they don't want to multiply. I know and, our, and there's nothing wrong with that. No. We don't have anything against that at all. But but we are structured to help you grow to the 15 to 20 person size. Um, that's really our sweet spot is getting small firms to that level. Um, our research shows that there's really a really a, a good, steady, stable spot when you're at that 15 to 20 person level. What is a management structure? Do you get them to the point where, you know, Alex and I have been have talked a lot about how big do we want F9 to go? We're, we're at seven people right now. Okay. And, you know, to us, the way we sort of thought about management structures, because we're both partners, we're both 50% owners and everything, is yeah. that once we got to 12 people, it would almost seem like a satellite would could possibly mm. happen after that. We see that sometimes. Sure. Is, what, if there's just one principle, does this structure, how do you guys, do you guys help them formalize a structure and how, how everything, the management works from there, like a tree? Yeah, we do. Uh, so we work a lot on succession planning. We, you know, you can't start working on that early enough, you know, of how, of what is the, what is the life of the firm beyond a, your current ownership structure look like? Uh, so we work with firms on that all the time. Um, it really doesn't make any difference if it's one owner or two or three, you know, it, it, uh, the the evolution of the firm looks the same. So if you're at seven right now, are those seven billable architects, or have you now invested in administration, admi- admin support? Those are seven billable architects. So you're probably at the level where you need to start thinking about part-time or full-time admin, you know, non-billable support to begin taking some of those tasks off of billable employees' yeah. shoulders. Well, we do have, yeah, we ha- we have we do have that contracted out. Uh, we have a bookkeeper; she does a great yep, job, yep, yep. stuff like that. Um, we have you know accountants and everything like. But you know, I agree with you. We have we are to the point where it's like I'd really like if people somebody could schedule things for me. Right. It right, would be right. nice. I mean, yeah. it sounds like a. You know that 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 non billable support it, it does it seems like get proposal you proposal writing yep. you know uh, ordering supplies I mean just the just the day to day stuff that it takes to to run a firm when you start to get to be well, normally we see it about five or six billable architects about that level is when we advise firms to now start investing in that uh, in that non billable support and it'll it'll pay off in spades I believe it it'll take things it. off of your plate that you're doing today that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. And then when you start getting, you know, at the t- 10 to 10, 11, 12 people, you start investing in a marketing person, you know, e- every firm should be outsourcing bookkeeping. There's no owner of a firm today that should be doing the day-to-day reconciliation. You can you can outsource that so easily and inexpensively. Um, and so that w- we work with firms immediately to do that and yeah you know. do you give recommendations uh so like you know let, let's say you took on our firm do you give recommendations um and and referrals to you say hey this is a great entity here or, or you know or, oh yeah yeah i mean i mean so i should i should back up we start every relationship out with a what we call a you know a, a review meeting of your firm so all of your listeners we are ready and willing to meet with you for a 30 to 40 minute video call uh, free of charge, and you'll get myself or one of our other executives with years and years of experience in this field to talk about your firm. We're not trying to sell you on anything. Talk about your firm. Listen to your challenges. We'll give you some of those insights, the things that we tell firms that are standards and norms and best practices. That's how we start everything. And then at the end of that, we say, well, if you're interested in going to the next step, we'll do a full assessment of your firm. Uh, we collect financial statements. We collect um, proposals and agreements. We look at your digital space, all of that. And we do this full um, kind of report back to you with some specific recommendations. 
a couple of different meetings throughout that process. You get a chance to know, get to know what it's like to work with us, and we take a deep dive into your firm. And then at the end of that, we decide if there's a long-term relationship that you're interested in and we're interested in. Yeah, we do that stuff all the time. So it's sort of like a con- the it's is it a, is it a gratis consultation meeting the upfront one, and then once you start digging in, obviously there's a fee. There's, there's a fee. There's yeah. fee, there's fee so, that comes yeah, with so it. So the initial meeting is free of charge, and again, anybody can schedule this. You can go to our website and schedule it. We do them every week, many times. Um, and then it's total no commitment, no obligation whatsoever. And when we get to the assessment, if you want us to take you know the extra step and go into the deep dive, we charge thirty five hundred dollars for that assessment. Um, we've never had a firm get to the end of the assessment and say that wasn't worth every penny I paid for it. You know, it's we give you really valuable insights into into your firm. Well, you've got me seriously thinking about doing it now, and I'm not <laughs> joking. I'm not yeah. joking because you know right now we're uh, all of our listeners know we're 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 just we're in this giant development project it's our first real estate development project and as soon as we finish that and it's selling so we're going to be able to you know right. get around the risk and right. and, and have a, a very large surplus of cash we're going to pay off a lot of debt and we'd like to restructure in that way so and you're going to learn a lot through this process yeah we, we see firms take on these development projects all the time and you know sometimes they're what they expected and sometimes they're not it's uh, been absolutely yeah it has been uh, turned my world upside down even, <laughs> right, even my sure. wife you know she's just like I did not. Un- I did not understand there was going to be sure. this much detail with all the finishes and everything. I was like, me either, you know. Yeah. It's been it's been pretty incredible. So, do you can do you have a can you can you think of one story you could tell us about of like maybe your most you don't even have to name names about the firm, yeah. but like what is the what is the best example you could give of somebody where you're just like they came in maybe they're even non-believers yeah. and you've turned around into this amazing success story. You know, I, I no the, the the answer is I can't think of one because there are so many. The firms that we work with, uh, we currently have 19 firms under contract. And when I say under contract, those are extensive contracts, multi-year contracts with us and um, and every one of those firms tells us that, you know, they wouldn't be where they are today without the support of CVG. And I'm not, that's not me. That's this right. amazing team of people that I have with me that are just really, really care about the firms that we work with and care about their success. Um, I guess the most, the most telling statement that I think is, is true um, is a firm that told us, you know, you're not helping me do anything that I didn't already want to do. You're just helping me get there a lot faster. Oh, there you go. And I, I think that's really it. Right? Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not bringing to the table some you know golden pill that helps you you know that you didn't know already. It's just you know you wanted to create a successful business. You just didn't really know how to get there, and we we help them get there. Yeah. That's the best way of describing it. Yeah, yeah. You're sort of like a fitness coach for for, <laughs> right. for, for business, right. really. Right. I mean, yeah. honestly, like I used to look down on fitness coaches, and then all of a sudden I saw a lot you know a lot of yeah. friends and family, and they go. It I it makes me be there on this time, and I do this, and it yeah. keeps me motivated, and it's streamlined, and it works for me. Um, that's awesome. Let's go back to the competition. So yeah, sure. The competition is really cool. Uh, it, just as a recap for everybody who's listening, is uh, th- this started in 2014, and it it's been consecutive every year, right? Yeah. Um, who, what was the idea with that? It was where how did that stem? Well, that was sort of Matt's original test to to see if there was really an interest in this topic. Um, you know, he he wanted to. He, he knew that there was a need, but he didn't know if the architecture space would really embrace this idea of building better businesses, you know. And so he, he put together, this, he had seen these business plan competitions in the tech space, you know, be very successful. And so, you know, in 2014, that was really all CVG was, was sort of a test of the competition. And we had over 150 registrants. Um, it was just an overwhelming success in terms in the, of... In the first year, yeah. yeah. In the first year. In terms of interest... Yeah. Uh, How did was, you get the word out about that? Did you buy an ad space or something? <laughs> that's and, a great question. Uh, you should interview Matt and ask him that. I, okay. Yeah, he, he, he just did grassroots stuff. He built a website, you know, and he, and he set up some social media channels. He had a brand, but it was very grassroots. Cool. You know, it was just get, get the word out and see if it takes on any uh, traction. And, you know, that's, real, that's when we met Mark LePage and became introduced to Entree Architect. And, the, you know, the missions were so aligned. Mm-hmm. And Mark was so supportive of us. Uh, and if any of your listeners have not checked out Entree Architect, I highly encourage them to do we it. We give him a reminder every good. episode. <laughs> good, so I'm good. glad you did, too. Yeah, Mark, Mark is 
I don't think we'd be podcasting yeah. if it wasn't for Mark. Yeah. Um, he's sort of became a partner with us, not not paid or anything, but just like yeah. we collaborate. Obviously, we're here at the ArcCAD booth, and you know we work with them. But yeah, Mark is great. It, it makes sense. It's just a hand to glove yep. fit. And I can say we wouldn't be where we are today without Mark and his support. And uh, so that that helped get the word out about the first competition and. Uh, just sort of took on a life from that point on. Yeah, yeah. You guys have had some amazing winners too. Um, very cool. So it, the competition was held this year. It again, was right. Yep. yep. And yep. you'll be announcing how many how many applicants did you guys have this year? You know, I can't answer that. We did we did a we've tested a, a couple of different processes. From you know, it's a free competition, right? And but but everybody's skeptical about what this is. Uh, free, so, free, free! But you should know that, right? It, there's a five thousand dollars prize at the uh, end. It, five thousand in in prizes. Yes, in we prizes. pay for the winner to come to the competition or come to the convention, lodging, and we do give a cash prize as well. Um, we have other sponsors like Monograph Software is a sponsor. Entrepreneur Magazine mm-hmm. is a sponsor. Harvest Time Tracking uh, is a sponsor. So, um, you know, we we. I can't tell you how many registrants we had. So there's a registration process, and then you have to turn in an executive summary. And then from the executive summaries, they selected 15 semifinalists, and then they had to sol- submit their full business plan. And then the, the jurors selected the, the winner from that. Uh, Art Gensler was one of our jurors oh, this year. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah we've, read his, we've read his book on the podcast. Good. It's fantastic. Art was fantastic. We really thank him for his, his input. Matt was a juror. Mark LePage was a juror. So they really they really run the process of the selection of the winner. Awesome, cool, cool. Well, maybe uh, I would love I would love if somebody we have a lot of, you know, the whole idea behind our podcast was we're bringing you inside the firm every every yeah. Friday. It's a very raw look. We, yeah. we without naming clients' names, but we will tell horror stories. We yeah, will tell sure. positive stories, and we get some amazing emails from people who are hey, I'm inspired to start it up. So I, I would I would hope some of them you know are listening to this yeah, and then they, so, yeah. they 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 join the competition yeah. next year. That would be very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so switching gears, I, there's three questions I want to ask everybody. Okay. Uh, on the podcast today and that is uh, so number one is uh, with the exponential growth of technology we've seen in the last century it seems that automation is inevitable are you at all worried that the profession will be lost to automation I mean I'm not an architect uh, so you're getting an outsider's perspective I, no way I mean I think I think the architect plays uh, more of an important role in the whole design process than I ever imagined before I started getting into this field and um, we have one one firm that's really good at marketing themselves as the guide, and I think that's absolutely true. I mean, oh, cool! The, you know, people need to be hiring their guide yes. to help them through, whether it's residential, commercial, whatever it is, help them through the design process. I don't think that's ever going to go away. And I think people are going to want. I think people want human to human interaction. I mean, come on! At the end of the day, I just get I get a little. I kind of scoff at the people who say we're going to go fully automation, but I, you know, I want to hear everybody's perspective on sure, it. You sure, sure. Um, okay, yeah. next one. Three D printing uh, was expected to transform architecture and construction, but uptake of it has been very slow. Once the technology has been adopted, how do you see architects adopting it? And do you think it would? It's possible it could usher back in the architect as master builder, wherein now all of a sudden, you, hey, I'm designing it. You know, we're sitting in the Arcad booth. There's all kinds of three D models that they that they have on their website. That we're literally designing it and modeling it as it will be exactly built for the first time. It's more than just AutoCAD 2D stuff. Yeah. And now they have access to machines and stuff that can go out there and do it. Yeah. Well, anybody who's spent any time in the arch- in the uh, tech space will tell you adoption is is like the evil word, right? Mm. It's it's is the hu- the biggest challenge. Of the- you could have the greatest technology in the world. You could come up with a robot that ties your shoes every morning, and it would take forever to get people to adopt to it. It doesn't make any difference how good it is. Adoption rates are king, right? And it's very, that's the biggest challenge is to get people to adopt software. So, you know, I, I would say I think technology is fantastic, even for the design space. I think there we have so many phenomenal tools out there. But the architecture firm needs to, uh, needs to really be in that role as guide. Understand all of the things that are out there and available to you. Doesn't mean you're going to use them all. Doesn't mean you're going to recommend them all. But understand the tools that are out there and available. 3D printing, one of them, uh, and help your clients know how to navigate that very complex field. And the rise of technology and the rise of the solutions is actually going to elevate the importance of the role of the architect because we're going to count on you to be the expert. Yeah. You know, you're going to count on you to know this stuff because I don't have the time to know yep, it. Yeah, we're done building from napkins, right, you know. Right, and I, right. I've actually done that in North Dakota <laughs> sure. as a as a young carpenter for sure. sure so. Sure. 
Cool. Okay, last one. Uh, so it, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you're here as a business person for this question. It's been 10 years since the Great Recession, and it seems like we're due for another one. What is one piece of advice you would give to a small firm or architect business owner as we near the end of the business cycle? If your marketing strategy today is answer the phone, you're in trouble, right? We talk to firms every week that are just so busy they can't, they can't dedicate the time to building a strong marketing program. And my advice to you is you have to make the time or you're going to be out of business, right? You have to do it today. And, and every week, you as a firm owner have to be dedicating time and resources to building a strong marketing and business development program so that when that happens, you're not sharing your brand promise to the market for the first time. You know, the first time people are hearing of mm -hmm. you is not when the recession happens, right? So build that program today that's generating leads for you, that's, uh, that's making people aware of your existence and of the value that you bring to the table, and you'll survive the next recession. Right. Yep. We can't just sit there and wait for the phone to ring. I agree. I've been told that so many times. Yeah. You have to get out there. Even if it's sometimes you, you have those, even if it's just you, you picking up the phone yourself, making the call and going out and having lunch, have, have, you know, that sort of thing, bringing a sell sheet, yep. talking to people. You never know how, where that meeting will, yep. will land you one year, two years, three years down the road. And I know you're busy and I know you have projects that are, you know, deadlines that are in jeopardy. And I know you've got to get proposals out the door and I'm, yeah, all of that. But you also, as an owner, have to spend the time working on the business, developing the business, promoting the business, if you're going to survive in the long run. Yeah, love it. Todd, this has been fantastic. Thank you for coming on Inside the Firm today. Thank you, Lance. Where can people follow you and get in touch with your company? Yeah, please go to charrettevg.com, C-H-A-R-R-E-T-T-E, V as in Victor, G as in George, dot com. Go to our website. All of our contact info is on there. You can schedule a meeting with us anytime you want, right on the website. Uh, and my email address is todd at charrettevg.com. You can email me anytime. Would love to talk to you if you're interested in CVG. And I uh, appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. All right. And now a word from one of our sponsors. Hey, everybody. If you are trying to learn Revit, I think you should learn from yours truly, Alex Gorin Land Psycho. Uh, we have a website called revitrocketship.com. We've been training university students, other professionals, our own staff for many, many, many years, and we made it available uh, online at revitrocketship.com. And what's great about it is that it's broken down into five to seven minute chunks, plus or minus on some of them, um, teaches you everything from families uh, to uh, a whole project base. And one of the differentiators, I think, there's actually two major ones. One is we're an actual firm, uh, f9productions.com, that does a lot of work. So we are implementing practices that are true. And what that means is that we're modeling like it gets built. Uh, we're doing uh, our walls a little bit different. You'll, you'll see in the videos of why we do it, but it actually works out in the end uh, to create a better model. We've uh, trained a lot of people, so this is not our first go around. And the other thing, too, is that you get our template. You, give the actu you get the actual template that we use, hone, develop, and improve every year um, in that system. Uh, so it's for free. So if you were starting a residential pro project, you'd start off on that. It'd have uh, everything set up the way that we like, the way that helps you uh, go faster, build cooler, cooler things, and, and be more awesome. So check that out, RevitRocketship.com. All right, I'm back with Zylea Burris, uh, Director of Marketing for the same company that Todd is with, Charette Venture Group. Uh, so Zylea is a marketing and communication strategist, strategist with more than 10 years of experience in the architecture and design industry and directs the marketing programs of all the CVG partner firms. Prior to joining CVG, she ran her own consulting business that helps innovate firms, increase their revenue and visibility through effective communication strategy and media relations. Previously, she served as marketing manager at two prominent architecture firms in Portland, Oregon, and as programs director at the Portland chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Zaylia graduated magna cum laude, cum laude with a BA in English Literature from New York University, NYU. That's no small task. And has written about art, design, and business for numerous publications. Zaylia, welcome to Inside the Firm. Thank you so much. Why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit more about what led you to working with architects in the capacity that you do right now? I will tell you, I was working in arts and culture after I graduated from NYU. I moved to Chicago. I worked at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a 
wonderful school. Yeah. And then I worked, I was a publicist at a record label, an independent record label oh, in Chicago, fun. which was so fun. I loved that as well. And then I also uh, became a freelance writer and then I became the arts editor at a magazine in my spare time. <laughs> and then um, after eight years of living in New York and Chicago, I really wanted more nature and more outdoor adventure, which is how I grew up. So I moved to Portland, Oregon. But before I moved to Portland, Oregon, I did a little sojourn at Arco Santi in oh, Arizona, yeah. if you're familiar. I am. So Arcosanti, for people who don't know, is um, a pretty famous, amazing um, experiment in urban planning, it, yeah. architecture, a social design. social experiment, really, it's, too. Yeah, it was it, the whole thing. Yeah, It is. It's a and fascinating late 60s, place. right? It started in 1970. 1970, mm-hmm. but born out Officially, of that whole yes. era of thinking. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yes. Paolo Soleri definitely started working in Phoenix in the 50s and 60s. And then, yeah, in 1970, he started his, his dream project, which was this arcology. Yeah. You know, so I, I lived there for about four months. And I actually studied, I didn't really study architecture, but I worked in permaculture. I'm really interested in just sustainable food systems and urban planning and just sustainable living in general. So that's actually my first real taste of architecture. And then I moved to Portland officially, and I got an amazing first job at Portland Architecture, uh, Portland Spaces Magazine. Okay. And I helped produce an a architecture and design awards program. And that's really where I just jumped full in and just met you know, many people, many architects in Portland, the whole design industry. We had a huge, we started a scholarship fund. We had a huge awards event at the Portland Art Museum. So that was just really exciting. But you're sort of, you were a designer yourself. At, I'm not at, a designer. At, at, not at all, huh? I'm a writer and communications expert. Okay. Well, you design words. How about that? Ah, yes. Words <laughs> I put words together. <laughs> yes. I think everybody designs something. I, I, I always, I, you know, you no know, matter what. I'm really good at actually space design. I really love decorating my own spaces and I'm really sensitive to lighting and things like that. So mm-hmm. I feel like I could have some capacity in that area. But. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, oh, one thing I was like, so since, since you're the marketing and communication strategist uh, at CBG is, uh, can you share with us without naming names, your <laughs> first or your favorite marketing success story that you've had so far at, at that firm? Mm, I love that question. Well, the one that just pops to my head is there's a pretty small firm in Seattle and they do highly sustainable work, um, someone on the firm is just getting their passive house certification, but they've been doing kind of straw bale, Mm. you know, net zero buildings forever, 20, 30 years. And, um, we just got one of their net zero ADUs into dwell. Oh, that's cool. So you guys will do that. Yeah. I mean, I have a background in PR and so, and I have some connections at dwell and we just pitched it to them and they loved it. Very cool. And it ended up being an online article, which was a cost breakdown, which honestly the client wasn't that thrilled. They wanted a different angle. They just wanted it to be about how beautiful the the house is. But looking at the article now, I think it's a perfect, a perfect way to talk about the ADU and encourage more people to do it. You know, property owners, people who can't afford to move, but they, you know, maybe they want some extra space and, yep. or they want to rent out their space. That's really huge right now. Right. And in places like Portland and Boulder, mm-hmm. it, you know, Boulder, we, that's where our firm is located mm-hmm. generally in, in Boulder County. Mm-hmm. Um, those places can't expand anymore because like Portland has this water ring on it, right? Boulder has a water mm-hmm. ring plus open space that surrounds the whole city. So the, these kind of ADU things, you know, mm-hmm. units, so they're going to become more and more popular. Exactly. Do you have an opinion on So speaking of getting into Dwell, stuff like that, um, we've been in Arc, Arc Daily a few times. We've been in, in Dwell. Mm-hmm. We've been just kind of like us doing it ourselves and saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to submit this. And luckily we got in. We didn't have somebody as awesome as you. Hopefully, uh, ho- hopefully I-, I actually talked with Todd uh, before this, as you know, and I was like, man, we need to get in touch with you guys as soon as we're done with our development and maybe have you guys kind of revamp us. Great. Um, in, in, you know, because I think you guys do a great job. It's uh, incredible. And I don't you. think anybody else is doing what you guys are doing. It's, it's, it's amazing. And I it's, know we were talking about our competitors yesterday. We don't really have any because good. we just have a really different model. Yeah. We're yeah. not traditional and consultants. It's, it, there's such a need. <laughs> there, I mean, architects, uh, we said, I said this with Todd too is architects are really great at design we're terrible at business and you know that's I mean the, it doesn't get taught in school you maybe have to take mm-hmm. when you get your master's it's like a two credit course or something at the end mm-hmm. do you have an opinion on well that dwell in instance of like is it better to be get published online versus versus paper and you're at this point because mm-hmm. online lives forever mm-hmm. right I think that's definitely the way things are going and so with this piece you know I wasn't upset that it was just an online piece because like you said, it does live forever. It's really easy to get that link and um, put it on all your social media, put it directly onto your website. Um, Here's some free advice firms. If you don't have kind of an awards press page, 
you know, I would consider looking at all the awards you've won, any kind of press you've received, and making sure if you have enough that there is a spot on your website to include those. And then it's really easy to um, just have a link to those online articles. I do think that's the way things are going. I love to see when I've pitched a project, I love to see my clients work in print just because it's beautiful. It is cool. And I'm a magazine nerd. Yeah. I grew up being obsessed with magazines. I wanted to start my own. I've worked for magazines. So I love print. I love real books. I love real magazines. You know, I love going to the store and like picking up a monocle and looking through that. It's just not the same reading it online, in my opinion. Um, but that's maybe more of an aesthetic thing. You know, but I think business-wise, I don't see any issue with focusing on online press. Onla- I think online is good because it lives in, like we said, per- perpetuity. But mm-hmm. then also, you know, but then it's the first, like, mo- people are finding people online, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll find your firm online. They'll go click on the links. And people people want to, like, be able to say, hey, yeah, we, are, we have an award-winning architect. Like, that's who did our house. You know, right. people like those Bregs things. Right. But from, we, so we've been in both. And the, what I would say about the about having tangible magazines is, we have a, we, like there's a fireplace in our uh, in our conference room where mm-hmm. we'll bring clients in and we'll do the meet and greet and we'll mm-hmm. talk about their project and we will pull the books physically mm-hmm. and that's a whole different experience for them because they know like oh that these guys aren't lying this is real they're award winning mm-hmm. they're published they're 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 so I think I think you got to if you can do both of those things that's a good point I mean I worked for a really great firm in Portland before I became a consultant you know and went out on my own and we got so much amazing press I created a whole like press area where we would just put up all of our magazines that we were in and awards you know i just created kind of a little shelf i think if you have a really cool office where you have clients come in quite often that's a different story than print is really cool if you have the architectural record magazine that you're in right there you know on your coffee table or on the conference table or displayed somewhere i think that's really cool so yeah you gotta have some you gotta i mean you're you're selling them that you should be hired, right? And that gives them some confidence, I think. It gives them confidence. It shows a little bit of legitimacy. I mean, of course, you're a legitimate firm already, but it just shows that people are listening to you and they're paying attention to you. And that's really important for a client. And some clients really love press themselves. So if you've already been in certain publications, they feel more confident because they want that same press. Yep. Couldn't agree more. All right. Opposite question. (laughs) Do you... (laughs) Do you have any advice you can share with small firms who can't possibly... Oh, sorry. No, no. Sorry. Um, <laughs> now, how Now, how about, again, without naming names, your most notable marketing failure story? And not that you have failed, but that you've seen other firms where you're like, oh, that wasn't a good idea. You shouldn't have done that. Is there anything mm-hmm. like that you could speak about? Mm-hmm. Or just bad practices to avoid? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am not thinking of anything specific at the moment, but I do have some advice, which is... I would not spend a lot of time and money on some kind of marketing campaign or endeavor without a strategy. You know, I'm, I'm being very general here, yeah. but I, I do see this. If you have a small firm, if you have a very specific marketing budget, let's say, um, you don't have just tons of money to spend and you decide to blow it on a bunch of swag, <laughs> right? you know, or you blow it on a one party, one open house at your firm, which I'm a big proponent of having events at your firm if you can afford it. But um, if you put all of your money in one basket for the whole year, um, I think that's a problem. Yeah. I think that you should really be strategic. You should come up with a plan with your marketing person if you have one and really lay out, okay, 5% of our annual you know, profits will go to marketing and this is what that means. So we have just as much for ads. We have just as much for um, a party, you know, for a, a client appreciation party. Um, we have just as much money for photography, uh, maybe for a PR consultant, you know, and just really list it out and don't put all your money in one basket. Yeah, that that you sort we, you sort of already answered this question, mm-hmm. um, but it leads right into it. Do you have any advice you can share with small firms who possibly can't afford to hire a marketing and communication strategist like yourself? Um, what can like what can what are some things just some basic stuff they can do on a shoestring budget? Because we have a lot of listeners who are just they're just starting their firm. Right, definitely. I would say make sure I'm a content person, <laughs> as I've mentioned, you know, as a writer. But I would make sure someone else looks at your content. If you are not conf- confident with your writing and your language skills, um, most architects are just fine. But I would just have an outside viewer, maybe a spouse or a friend who is a writer, just someone in your network who is a good communications person, have them look at the content on your website and just be really harsh. Like, had, what had, are you communicating? We had Alex's mom do it. 
Oh. <laughs> and we were not I love and we it. were not ashamed to do it because, I love it. and she picked cuz Alex already knows this and he's going to listen to this episode because he's not here um, that he's a terrible uh, speller. He his grammar oh. his, his, gra- his grammar is okay but his spelling is oh it's just atrocious. Um, so thank God we had his mom look right. at it. And now now we have actually his his mom, his wife and my wife look at it. Okay. And my wife was an English major, so oh, good. I agree with you. Yeah, unless okay. I, you know until we can hire somebody like that, that yeah. is that is just a no-brainer. Make yeah, it's better. really. I mean, especially spelling. There's no excuse to have spelling mistakes and on your some, website. Sorry, guys. Yep. And some there's clients, spell check. There's, there's spell Grammarly. Check. It, and it will. It will. Some clients will take it to the point where uh, we've had this happen to us, mm-hmm. where they they've seen a spelling error, they've forgiven us, but you could tell they almost mm-hmm. didn't sign mm-hmm. because I think that's an indication of your lack of attention to mm-hmm. detail. Mm-hmm. You know, it looks careless. Yep. And that's the last thing you want an architect Absolutely. that you're hiring. Absolutely right. Right. <laughs> Building fall down, go boom. Mm. It's not good for anybody. Right. Um, okay, well, I've got some. I've got some. Uh, some last, mm-hmm. last, like three questions here to ask mm-hmm. you um, that I've been asking everybody. Uh, and th- you're coming from a sort of a in in and outside source because mm-hmm. I know you're not an architect, right. but you work with them all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, with the exponential growth of technology we've seen in the last century, it seems that automation is inevitable. Are you at all worried that we we could lose the profession to automa- automation? Mm-hmm. I've heard that I should be worried about this. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I. For being pretty tech savvy myself, I'm also a little bit of a Luddite where I don't jump on the new technology. I'm pretty skeptical for Mm -hmm, some reason. mm -hmm. So for me, I'm still a little bit not interested in AI and those kinds of things. And I am interested in automation, but not to the point where it puts humans out of jobs, which is exactly what it's meant to do. So I'm a little bit on the fence about it because I know a lot of people who are uh, nomads and entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and their whole lives, you know, the four hour work week. That yep. whole thing is dependent on automation. Yep, yep. And systems that are set up once, and then you get to go to, to the beach. You damn, know, damn you, Tim Ferriss. And you're Ferris. making money while you're sleeping. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Tim Ferriss. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm really on the fence. There are pros and cons to everything, and there are pros and cons to automation. And maybe I should be more worried. I'm not that worried about communication, losing communications and writing to robots, because if you've seen, if you've seen any, even Google Translate, it's just so faulty. You know, Siri. Just, <laughs> annoys me. It's they're so faulty. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten text, text messages from people who had spoken into the text, and it's just maybe it'll be there in twenty years, but I'm not that concerned yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, three D printing uh, was expected to transform architecture and construction, but uptake of it has been slow. Once the technology has been adopted, do you think you could see architects adopting it uh, to the point where it'll usher them back in as being not only the architect but also the master builder? You know, we had a three D printer at my last firm, and <laughs> We spent a lot of money on it, and people played around with it, and nothing happened. We had some funky little toys, and, and you know that's probably the case at a lot of firms. And so I don't, you know, I don't know yet. I mean, I, I see the potential in it for many industries, not just ours. But you know, for, from a marketing standpoint, I hope that it becomes more, um, more popular and more used because I think it's a great way to show clients. Um, what you're thinking without doing the whole traditional models, yeah. which are beautiful, but I think almost everyone has decided that they're too cumbersome. Yep. Unless you have a huge client, a huge firm, where you have your own workshop, or you're Jonathan Segal, who, who's <laughs> just an architect, just developer, and he he kicks, right. yeah, he does it. He still does them. I, I'm hopefully going to interview him tomorrow and oh, ask him great. that question. Um, all right, uh, last one. It's been 10 years since the Great Recession, and it seems like we are due for another one. What is one piece of advice you would give to a small firm architect or business owner as we near the end of this business cycle? Mm-hmm. Diversify. I think you all know this, but you need to diversify the markets you're in. I know a lot of firms that are like 99% into healthcare, Oof. 95% into... High-end homes. Uh, higher ed. High-end homes. Well, that's... That's really that's, a bad one. That's a really bad one. Yeah. Um, so I would just say diversify. You know, I tell all my clients this and our investment partners at CVG. Um, we really are trying to make sure that if they're pigeonholed in any way now, that they're really looking on how to expand that market in which they're pigeonholed and try to look at uh, nearby markets, you know, related markets where it's easy to leverage your existing experience let's say an ADUs or something and leverage it into, um, you know, other types of projects, you know, maybe, maybe, yeah, Commer- you know, commercial, small commercial, multifamily, you know, really just diversify a little bit of public, a little bit of private, you know, one of the firms I worked for in Portland, they survived because they had a huge public project that they had just won right before it crashed, 
like, yeah, around 2009, 2010. And because the public project was already funded, yep. they survived. And I would just say just absolutely diversify. Beautiful answer. We See, it's not just everybody who's listening. It's not just Alex and I who say that all day long. We, what we say is we have, you need to have as many legs and tentacles as possible. Definitely. Um, because that's exactly why we started our firm is mm-hmm. we were laid off in the Great Recession mm-hmm. because we worked for firms. God bless them. Daniel Liebskin is who Alex worked for. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were just not diversified enough because mm-hmm. they were just going after these giant projects that, you know, that's not happening, right? Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with the firm I was with. It was actually high-end residential, and that's why I brought it up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. diversify. You heard it, everybody. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming on the firm today. Um, where can people follow you and get in touch with you? If they want to, if they want to reach out, sure. Um, my contact info is on the Shred Venture Group website, and then my personal consulting uh, website is zileaburrows.com. So feel free. There's a contact form on that if you have any questions about just general communications, PR, um, things like that. So both places. Awesome. Thanks. Again. And LinkedIn too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lance. You're welcome. And now a word from one of our sponsors. If you work with specifications in your firm, you've probably come across uh, outdated manufacturer specs and confusing notes. Not only does that happen, that also happens with with code books too. And I'm ashamed to say it, but you know, sometimes you're just researching a code online and then you're like, oh, is this 2012, 2015, 2009, 2006? Am I in a county? Do they even have rules? Um, so you don't know if they applied. The same thing can be true for your specs. So, uh, you know, you don't want to find products that no longer exist or even companies that no longer exist. And trust me, I have done both. Uh, maybe you even pay for specifications. Well, don't do that because there's a better way, uh, to find manufacturer specs for your products and documentations. And that's ArtCat. ArtCat.com is a free library. It has over 1400 up-to-date, accurate specifications. Up-to-date and accurate are the keywords. Uh, they're written by FCSI. CCS AIA professionals based on manufactured data. Arquette uses powerful search engines to find the right specifications for your products and downloads them in multiple formats for free, free, free. You don't even have to register. Look at that. Easy, convenient. Go to arquette.com and get the information you need. That's it. All right. Now I'm back with Emily Hall. Vice President of Marketing for Charette Venture Group. Emily will be the trifecta of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the tr- of the triple group we had here from Charette Venture Group. Um, so Emily brings over 18 years of architectural marketing experience to CBG with a focus on communicating the unique value that small to mid-sized design firms have to offer. She directs marketing efforts for CBG and oversees the marketing programs of their partner firms. Emily served for over six years as Senior Associate and Director of Marketing and uh, and new business development at Union Studio Architecture, Community, and Design, and for nine years at Durkee, Brown, Viverios, I probably didn't get that right, and Werenfels Architects, both small architectural firms in Providence, Rhode Island, that have experienced significant growth. Emily, welcome to Inside the Firm. Thank you. Why don't, you kick, why don't you kick us off by telling a little bit more about your daily, what you know, stuff that you do. Like, what do you, what do, you do at Charette Venture Group to help small to medium-sized firms? I'm basically working within Charette Venture Group to identify new firms that we can work with that need our services. So that can be everything from creating thought leadership content that serves as a lead magnet, you know, webinar ideas, white papers, any kind of information that would be helpful for our audience, and um, which is small architecture firms, to improve their businesses. So by creating that content or basically harnessing what we already have, uh, I try and reach out to new firms that would be eventually uh, clients of CBGs, ideally investment partners. But we just start with a conversation. That's, that's what we're really interested in is talking to as many small firm architects, leaders that we possibly can because it's how we get to know the industry better, right? Yeah, so you're yeah. in on those very, the first consultation meeting that, yes. that Todd went over. Okay. Yes, yes. It's usually Todd, Rena, and myself, Rena Klein. Um, one, usually two of the three of us yep. will be on that call. Yeah. And that's, that's where we just really get to know firms. We just get to talk to them. It's a free business consultation for them so they can pick our brains about anything that's going on in their firms that they want advice on, um, you know, things that they're doing right, things that they might need help with. So it's, it's, 
it's really we like to think of it as a meaningful conversation for both of us. You know, it's not just a pitch of CVG; it's us getting to know, getting to know the firms better. Yeah, and with. understand them, where they're going, where they've been, mm-hmm. um, what their goals maybe are, and everything like that. I think that yeah. was one of the most enlightening things that I heard so far uh, in, in talking in talking with Todd, uh, Todd right at the beginning yeah. about CVG is. You, how your intake process works yeah. and then the next step from there and mm-hmm. then some success stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so speaking of success stories, mm-hmm. can, can you share with us, without naming names, mm-hmm. your favorite marketing success story that you've been with uh, for any, any firm that you've worked with so far? Okay. With CVG? Um, yeah. Well, we had a, a rebrand with one of our partner firms uh, that lasted for a year and... It, the outcome was really great. Uh, it was it, they were very very detail oriented, and involved in the process, and really crafted their their brand to to just be very authentic to them. And and all of our rebrands are that way. But they were really involved, and they managed every single aspect of the process, you know, in a very detailed way. So the outcome is just really very much their personality and I'm happy to share that with you. It's Thoughtcraft Architects, one of our investment partners. They have offices in Boston and in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So just that collaboration yielded a really nice outcome. Do you ever find that when you go to do the rebrand that there's some resistance or that the firm you're working with um, they they're trying they they can't let go right I mean because yet, yet at the end of the day you guys are kind of producing everything right absolutely and that's that's a really good point to bring to bring up I've had that experience I've done several rebrands in my career and the firm that the firms that we're working with have to be very clear on what their value proposition is what their mission is what their um, you know their their firm culture is what the, and they all the, all the principles have to be in agreement before we can really prepare a effective rebrand and then have the process go smoothly i've had experiences in the past where i've worked for firms where the principals didn't agree necessarily on what where they wanted the firm to go or really what the rebrand was meant to accomplish and that was not as a that was just a difficult process we wound up getting there in the end but it made the process tough and not fun, right? And you want to have and, fun. I yeah. got, you got to want to have fun when you're doing this yeah, stuff. I would you feel think. like you're, you know, prying, you know, baby out of somebody's hands <laughs> when you're rebranding, and they, they don't want to rebrand. Right. You know, it's it becomes a difficult process. But the opportunities are just so limitless with a rebrand. You can really reposition yourself yeah. um, in the marketplace, and you're doing it well. What I found is that the having a great, really great creative brief is instrumental in the process. So knowing why you are rebranding, what you are trying to accomplish through the rebrand. It's not just rebranding for rebranding's sake, oh, we want a new design. It's where do we really want to be? And who comes up with the creative brief? Is that you guys yes. after listening to them yes. and you're just kind of we presenting it, it to them? Well, we do it together. Um, we just ask them several questions about what uh, what they're looking to get out of the process, where they are. Where, you know, it's, it's a series of questions to get to know them better and get to know what their goals are. And um, in the rebrand process, because you have to ask the right questions to be able to know what problem you're trying to solve. Like I agree. Every good it's designer. so critical. Yep. So, so it's not just you know slapping a new color on something. It's really knowing where they want to go and what's not working about their existing brand. Because sometimes it's not rebranding isn't the solution. Sometimes you talk to a firm and you realize the brand isn't the problem. You know the other marketing activities need fixing or business development needs more attention and so that's what you find throughout that process and that's where it's really helpful to know a firm inside and out before going through a rebranding process and that's what cbg offers that's unique is we're looking at the whole system and then also taking that a step further with a branding do you guys do you guys also do um so you know our company is all we do we only deal with private Private, other private companies, private mm-hmm. developers. We don't do any mm-hmm. public work at yeah. this point. If somebody like me wanted to make that next leap mm-hmm. and try to get into public work, um, I've heard stories from other little firms that try to do that with us and mm-hmm. go, up, go up against the big boys who have dedicated marketing firms that mm-hmm. put together the whole proposals. Do you, do you help set mm-hmm. people up in that way? Yeah, that's a tricky one. And, um, you know, that takes a lot of time and, and patience and perseverance. 
firms that I've worked with have have entered the public market uh, successfully, and they've done that by taking on small jobs, you know, real uh, kind of ankle biter type projects that other the the big firms wouldn't touch, right? Like a locker room renovation or you know something a roof replacement kind of thing, um, you know, something that just isn't very sexy but helps start the relationship. And it's all about those relationships. It's having that procurement officer trust you mm-hmm. and trust your firm and get to know you. So start small. Um, start small. And yeah, I, and I had do an, a great job. Yeah, I agree. No, I think you do have to start small. It's, it, you just have to break in. You have to break into that gracefully, right? Mm-hmm. And then and execute and, and nail it. I actually had an employee, a former employee, laugh at me once because I said, like, what if we just did... I was like, what do you think about we'll get into public work? And I was like, we'll just do, you know, even if we're just doing ramps, we're doing 80, we're doing ADA ramps for a year. And he laughed at me. And, I, and so it's reassuring to hear somebody else say like, yeah, you just, you go do something small, you figure mm-hmm. out how to do it and do it well and execute and gain the trust. And then maybe they'll give you the in, the bookstore mm-hmm. at the university yeah. next, you know what I mean? And yeah. then eventually, you know, 10 years down the road, you'll get the big endowment building. I don't know. But that's that's where it's at. Another another recommendation I would have is um, I know in Rhode Island and I'm assuming other states that uh, th- these are public documents. So the proposals responses are public documents. So certainly in Rhode Island, you can go and literally check out uh, existing, the respo- ones. existing proposals that your oh, competitors have submitted. And oftentimes they have the scoring matrix attached to them. So if you really want to see what other firms proposals are looking like the content that they're including and what the scoring matrix is around that it's a it's a great resource and i don't think many people know that you no, can do that you just gave us a golden nugget well i think that that's was good. wonderful and i'd call your you know call your state and see if you can if they offer that service but um i learned so much and that's that's something i did when i was uh you know early on in my career is just seeing what other proposals looked like and um, how other firms were speaking about themselves you can really differentiate yourself when you know that and say, okay, this is all the boilerplate. You know that they must be just, their eyes must be glazing over after reading 20 of these proposals where they start off yep. with, we're an award-winning firm, you know, every <laughs> single <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, we say it too. Yeah. No, no, with that, what's, with that parallel is so interesting because, I mean, it's, it's public, but when we started our firm, we put out a Craigslist ad, a fake one, and said, hey, we have a cabin. We need it designed. Um, we need, you know, the architecture, the structure, whatever. And we got like a hundred um, proposals from people. And that's exactly what we did is we could look through them and said, like, what stands out to us? Like, think, put ourselves in the client. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. you know, it's a little it's a little sleazy. I mean, mm-hmm. a, kind of. But at the end of the day, like, it worked. I don't know. Now we have these pretty graceful proposals that we put out to people and people can yeah. understand them. So I think that's a, that's a really valuable yeah. point. I'm glad you brought that up. People yeah. will love to hear that. Yeah. And it's really important to really connect the dots. And what you see when you read a lot of very um, average proposals is just a, you know spewing of information about every project that they've done and, and without being very specific as to why it matters to that client and really taking the time to you know list only a few projects on your bio that say exactly what projects you've worked on that the client would care yeah. about. Listing a bunch of street addresses means nothing to anybody. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to do is just throw that information out there and hope something sticks with a potential client, but you're wasting everybody's time by doing yeah. that and resources, your own resources too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I know. It sounds like you guys take the guesswork out of a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, uh, the opposite question I have of that is, um, how do you without uh, without naming names? Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a, do you have your most? Can you n- tell us the most notable marketing failure story? And it doesn't have to be obviously. You guys do a great job. I'm saying where you've seen other people do, where you're like, wow, you put all of your money and resources into this one thing. That was a bad idea. Oh yeah. Like what to um, avoid? Okay, that's. I think that really flashy, customized websites are a thing of the past. That seems to me like. Um, I know people that have put you know, fifty thousand dollars into a you know flash website or some you know just technology that doesn't um, it doesn't it, it's overkill. Yeah, you know you pe- really think about being two clicks away from getting the information you need, and you don't have to have all kinds of bells and whistles. I mean that's a really you can get really tempted to um, invest in that and and get really lost in that. 
you really need to step back and say like what's just the what's the clearest way to reach our audience we you know less almost, is more yeah, we, we, call, is we more. call it we call it digital fluff and that's a, that's exactly what that's the term that I'm looking for. Yeah. yeah, our students do that with us. We teach at CU Boulder too, um, in addition to all the other stuff that we do. Mm-hmm. And we see that when they do their PowerPoint presentations, I go, I don't need slide transitions. I actually don't need anything but one picture per slide. Yeah, and you to talk about it, and yeah. it's that simple. So yeah, cut the fluff. Content. If you're going to spend money on something, spend it on professional photography. Ooh, that is what we tell all of our firms. Um, you know, if. if you have a limited budget, which most small firms do. Uh, that's the best thing you can. That's about. That's just the best investment you can make. Yeah. I mean, you see people investing in nice websites, and then they have every project they've ever done that's you know from photos taken on their iPhone. It's like no, 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 no. Have a few great, really nicely photographed projects and a simple website. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. You kind of already answered the next question. Um, so I'll see if you maybe have one more little nugget you can mm-hmm. give us. Uh, do you have any advice you can share with small firms who possibly can't afford to hire a marketing strategist? Um, what can they do in a shoestring budget? What are just some, some fundamental things they could do before the, to get them to the point of being able to hire you guys in the future? Okay. Um, well... Let's see. I, I, there's one offering I, I, I can certainly put out. If anybody wants to email me, we have a really great Excel spreadsheet that we use with all of our firms. And it basically lists, you know, the months are the columns and the marketing activities are the rows. And it's a really great, great way to keep track of everything in one place that you want to, that you want to do, basically. Like all your awards deadlines, uh, proposal deadlines, um, you know, business development activities, who you want to talk to, what month, photography that needs, when it needs to be done. And you can really lay that all out and keep referring back to that document and updating it. And then you have a really good look ahead using this, you know, using a spreadsheet like this. So you don't have any fire drills. It's the fire drills that kill you, right? It's like, oh, shoot, I forgot that awards thing is due tomorrow. Can we throw something together? Yeah. Um, so that's one resource, and that's free. Anybody can email me, and I'll send them Where a copy. Would the, how, would t- can you give me your email? Oh, sure. Emily at charettevg.com. Okay, awesome. Yeah, send that to me, and happy to help. Um, I think asking yourself really clear questions about your mission and vision and value proposition, even if you don't have a marketing team, being, being able to communicate your, your elevator pitch and your really unique value goes a long way. And I say, lastly, I would add business development. They're, most of the firms we work with are really either very good at marketing or very good at business development. Very few firms are great at both. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, and that's a really nice combination. A lot of people try and, you know, lean on one strength um, and, you know, to substitute for the other. But they, both activities are important. Even if, you know, you're not a natural at business development, you really do need to be following up with previous clients having coffee with potential new clients and making sure you're doing some pretty basic, keeping your basic marketing activities up to date. Like social media is free. You know, yeah. gr- granted, you know, time is money, but social media is free. And um, newsletters like uh, I think MailChimp and Active Campaign and those types of software programs, you can usually get a pretty affordable uh, version of those. That's mm-hmm. another one. I would recommend as a means to reaching out to your mailing list and just Keeping, keeping yourself top of mind, but sending them information of value. So that's, you know, that's another free, free thing that a, a small firm could do is just make sure that they're reaching out to their former clients every few months and just letting them know what they're up to and um, sending them maybe helpful tips on certain things. Um, again, that's, that's free. So yeah, 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 beautiful advice. Okay, I've been asking some, uh, we'll kind of wrap up with, uh, I've been asking everybody mm-hmm. a couple questions and I would like your take on them. Um, so it's been about 10 years since the Great Recession, mm-hmm. and it seems like we are due for another one. What is one piece of advice you would give to a small firm architect or business owner as we near the end of this business cycle? Oh, yes, I definitely <laughs> lived through the last one. Um, yep. Yeah. Business development. Keep your business development activities current. That way, when, you, when, it count, when the market starts to constrict and it's time to shake the bushes, it's not as awkward, right? You're not reaching out to somebody you haven't talked to in five years and hoping they have a project for you. You're keeping current with all of your existing for, and you know, former clients and um, you know, knowing what's going on in their lives and keeping that relationship 
going so that they're automatically thinking of you for the next project. You don't, you're not um, scrolling through your Rolodex. And that's an old term. I'm dating myself. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, you're not, when, the, when, the, when the phone stops ringing, you're not forced to do things that you're not, you haven't been uh, accustomed to doing. Well, you, you kind of, I, I kind of get the sense that you would look a little bit desperate at that point. You don't want to no. seem desperate. You always want to. People, when you get hired, you get hired because you're confident. You, people can, the, the client believes that you're going to solve the problems and smooth things out, yeah. and things are going to go well, right? So all of a sudden, if you're reaching back out to them in a desperation, I think that could go go sideways. So absolutely, yeah, that's just I, it's it's free and easy to keep in touch with people and really continue to um, build and develop those relationships. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on Inside the Firm today, Emily. Um, I I really appreciate your time and and your nuggets of gold that you dropped. (laughs) Everybody, I hope they're helpful and let people know they can always call us and just schedule a nice half hour with us to talk. Beautiful. Thanks again. Thanks, Lance.